Uh, well, so you mentioned Einstein predicted that black holes don't exist, or just did, or thought don't exist that in nature. Don't don't exist in uh, nature. When Einstein came up with his theory of gravity in 1915, November 1915, uh, a few months later, another physicist, uh, Karl Schwarzschild, he was the director of the Potsdam Observatory, but he was a patriot, a German patriot. Mm -hmm. So he went into the First World War fighting for Germany, but while he was at the front he sent a postcard to Einstein saying, you know, a few months after the theory was developed, saying, actually, I found a solution to your equations, and that was a black hole solution. And uh, then he died a few months later. And Einstein was a pacifist, and he survived. So the, the lesson from this story is that if you want to work out uh, the consequences of a theory, you <laughs> better be a pacifist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, but uh, the point is that uh, uh, this solution was known shortly after Einstein came up with his theory, but in uh, but in 1939, Einstein wrote a paper in the Annals of Mathematics saying, even though the solution exists, I don't think it's realized in nature. And his argument was, if you imagine a star collapsing, uh, stars often spin, and the spin will prevent them from making a black hole, collapsing to a point. So, I mean, can you maybe one of the many things you uh, you have work on, you're an expert in, is black holes. Can you first say what are black holes? And second, how do we know that they exist? Right, so black holes are the ultimate prison. <laughs> you know, you can check in, but you it's can never romantic. check out. <laughs> uh, even uh, light cannot escape from them. Mm -hmm. So there are extreme structures of space and time uh, and there is this so-called Schwarzschild uh, radius or, or the event horizon of a black hole. Once you enter into it with a spaceship, you would never be able to tweet back to your friends and tell them. By the way, I asked the students in my class, freshman seminar at Harvard, I said, uh, let me give you two uh, possible journeys that you can take. I said, suppose aliens come to Earth and um, suggest that you would board their spaceship would you do it? Um, and the second is, suppose you could board a spaceship that will take you into a black hole, would you do it? So all of them said to the first question, yes, under one condition, that I'll be able to maintain my social media contacts and report <laughs> back, share the experience with them. I couldn't, uh, but personally, I have no footprint on social media. Yeah, which is a, as a matter of principle. Yeah, my wife asked me when we got married, and uh, I uh, honor that. And, and I told you, know, you offline, I need to get married to such <laughs> such a woman. She truly is a special lady. Well, she <laughs> she she was wise enough to recognize the risk, but um, <laughs> it saves me time, and it also keeps me away from crowds. You know, I don't have the uh, notion of what the, a lot of other people think, so I can no, think independently. Think exactly. Yeah, exactly. But uh, putting so. I was surprised to hear that for students, it's extremely important to share experiences. Even if they go on a spaceship with aliens, they still want to brag about it rather than look around and see what's going on. You this know? is not an option when you go to the black hole, is exactly <laughs> the point. So for the black hole, they said no, because yes. there, obviously you can find your death after uh, you get into it, and you, and you, you crash in the singularity. There is this singularity in the center. So inside the event horizon, we know that all the matter collects uh, at a point. Now, we can't really predict what happens at the singularity because Einstein's theory breaks down. And we know why it breaks down, because it doesn't have quantum mechanics that talks about small distances. We don't have a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity so that it will predict what happens in near a singularity. And in fact, you know, I once, um, a couple of years ago, I had uh, a flood uh, in my basement. I mean, the, um, and I, I invited the, a plumber to come over and, and figure out, and, and we found that uh, the sewer was clogged mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, tree roots that got into it. And we solved the problem. But then it, uh, I, I, I thought to myself, well, isn't that what happens at the singularity of a black hole? Because... Uh, the question is, where does the matter go? You know, if, you know, in the case of a home, I never thought about it, but yes. the water, all the water that we use goes in, you know, through the sewer to some reservoir somewhere. And 
The question is what happens inside a black hole. And one possibility is that there is an object in the middle, just like a star, you know, and everything collects there. And the object has the maximum density that we can imagine, like Planck density. It's, it's the ultimate density that you can have, uh, where gravity is as strong as uh, all the other forces. Um, so you can imagine this object, very dense object at the center that collects all the matter. Another possibility is that there is some tunnel, that, just like the sewer, it, it takes the matter into another place. Um, and we don't know the answer, Where, but I wrote a Scientific American essay about it, and, uh, admitting my, our ignorance. So it's a fascinating question. What happens to the matter that goes into a black hole? I actually recommend it to some of my colleagues that work on string theory, I, uh, at the closing of a conference, I'm, I'm the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard, which brings together astronomers, physicists, philosophers, and mathematicians. And we have a conference once a year. And at the end of one of them, since I'm the director, I had to summarize. And I said that I wish we could uh, go on a field trip to a black hole nearby. And I highly recommend to my colleagues that work on string theory, to enter into that black hole because then they can test their theory mm -hmm. when they get inside. But one of the string theorists in the audience, Nimar Kani Hamad, uh, immediately raised his voice and said, you have an ulterior motive for sending us into a black hole, <laughs> uh, which I didn't deny, but um, at any event. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's true, that's true. Can you say why we know that black holes exist? Right, so um, it's an interesting uh, question because black holes were considered a theoretical construct uh, and Einstein even denied their existence in 1939. Uh, but then um, in the, the mid-1960s, uh, quasars were discovered. These are very bright sources of light, a uh, hundred times brighter than their host galaxy which are point-like at, uh, at the center of galaxies. And uh, uh, it was immediately suggested uh, by Ed Salpeter in the West and by Yaakov Zeldovich in the East uh, that these are black holes that accrete gas, collect gas from their host galaxy that are being fed with gas. And they shine very brightly because as the gas uh, falls towards the, the black holes, uh, just like water, um, you know, running down the the sink, uh, the, the gas swirls and uh, then rubs against itself and heats up and shines very brightly because it's very hot, close to the black hole, by viscous uh, by viscosity it 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 heats up, uh, and in in the case of black holes, it's the turbulence, the turbulent viscosity that causes it to heat up, so. Um, we get these very bright sources of light just from black holes that are supposed to be dark. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing escapes from them, but they create a violent environment where gas moves close to the speed of light and therefore shines very brightly, much more than any other source in the sky. And we can see these quasars all the way to the edge of the universe. So we have evidence now that when the universe was, you know, about... Uh, 7% of its present age, you know, infant. Yes. Uh, already back then, you had black holes of a billion times the mass of the sun, which is quite remarkable. You know, it's like finding giant babies in a nursery, you know, like, uh, <laughs> how can these black holes grow so fast? You know, less than a billion years after the Big Bang, you already have a billion times the mass of the sun in these black holes. And the answer is presumably there are very quick processes that build them up. Uh, they, 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 uh, they build quickly. Very quickly. And uh, so we see those black holes, and that was found in the mid 1960s, but in 19, in, sorry, in 2015, exactly a hundred years after Einstein came up with his theory of gravity, yeah. the LIGO observatory detected gravitational waves. And these are just ripples in space and time. So according to Einstein's theory, the, the, the innovation, the ingenuity of Einstein's theory of gravity that was formulated in November 1915 was to say that space and time are not rigid. You know, they are, they respond to matter. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have two black holes and they collide, it's just like a stone being thrown into a 
this on the surface of a pond, they, they generate waves, per, uh, disturbances in space and time that propagate out at the speed of light. These are gravitational waves. They create a space-time storm around them, and then the waves go all the way through the universe and reach us. And if you have a sensitive enough detector like LIGO, you can detect these waves. And so it was not just the message that we received for the first time, gravitational waves, but it was the messenger. So there are two aspects to it. One is the messenger, which is gravitational wave for the yeah. first time were detected directly. Yes. And the second was the message, which was a collision of two black holes because we could see the pattern of the ripples oh, in space and time. And it was fully consistent with the prediction that Schwarzschild made for how a black the space-time around the black hole is because when two black holes collide, you can sort of map mm. from the message that you get, you can reconstruct what, what really happened and it's fully consistent. And in 2017 and 2020, there's two Nobel Prizes. That's right. Uh, uh, that had uh, to do with the black holes. Can you maybe describe in the same masterful way that you already been doing uh, what those Nobel Prizes were given for? Yeah, so the 2017 was given for the LIGO collaboration for discovering gravitational waves from collisions of black holes. Uh, and um, the 2020 Nobel Prize in physics was given for uh, two things. One was theoretical work that was done by Roger Penrose in the 1960s, demonstrating that black holes are inevitable when uh, stars collapse. Mm -hmm. And um, it was mostly mathematical work. And actually Stephen Hawking uh, uh, also contributed significantly to that uh, frontier. And unfortunately he is not alive, so he could not be honored. So Penrose received it on his own. Um, and then uh, two other astronomers received it as well, uh, Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel, and they provided conclusive evidence that there is a black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy uh, that weighs about four million times the mass of the sun. And they found the evidence from the motion of stars very close to the black hole. Just like we see the planets moving around the sun, there are stars close to the center of the galaxy and they are orbiting at very high speeds of order thousands of kilometers per second or thousands of miles per second per second. Uh, think about it, yeah. uh, which uh, can only be induced at those distances if there is a four million solar mass wow. object that is extremely compact. And the only thing that is compatible with the constraints is a black hole. And uh, uh, they actually made a movie of the motion of these stars around the center. Uh, one of them moves around the center over a decade, you know, six, uh, over time scales that we can monitor. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a breakthrough in a way. Um, uh, so combining LIGO with uh, the detection of a black hole at the center of the Milky Way and, and in many other galaxies like quasars, uh, you know, now, now uh, I would say uh, bl you know, black hole research is vogue. You know, it's, it's very much in fashion. You know, we <laughs> saw it back in 2016 when we established the uh, black hole initiative. Yes, you kind of saw that there's this uh, excitement about uh, in in uh, breakthroughs and uh, discoveries around black holes, which are probably one of the most fascinating objects in the universe. I mean, it's up there. Right. Uh, they're both terrifying and beautiful, right? Just and they capture the entirety of the physics that we know about this universe. I right? should say the re you know the question is where is the nearest black hole? Can we visit it? That's a, and uh, you know I wrote a paper with my undergraduate student, uh, Amir Siraj, uh, suggesting that perhaps, you know, there could be, if there is one in the solar system, we can detect it. Because, um, I don't know if you heard, but there is a claim that maybe there is a, 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 a planet nine in the solar system, um, because we see some anomalies at the outer parts of the solar system. So some people suggested maybe there is a planet out there that was not yet detected. So uh, people searched for it, didn't find it, it weighs roughly five times the mass of the Earth. And we said, okay, maybe you can't find it because it's a black hole. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, that was formed early in the universe. Is that possible? So, I so mean, wh wh where do you stand on it that? It could be that the dark matter is made of black holes of this mass. You know, we don't know what the dark matter is made of. You could, right. it could be the uh, black holes. So we said, but there is an experimental way to test it, and the way to do it is because uh, is there is the Oort cloud of icy rocks in the outer solar system, and if you imagine a black hole there. Um, every now and then a rock will pass close enough to the black hole to be disrupted by the very strong gravity close to the black yes. hole and that would produce a flare that you can observe and we calculated how frequently these flares should occur mm. and with LSST on the Vera Rubin Observatory we found that you can actually test this hypothesis That's brilliant. and if you don't see flares then you can put limits on the existence of a black hole in the solar system. It would be extremely exciting if there was a black hole, if Planet Nine was a black hole, because we could visit it, <laughs> you know, and we can examine it. Yeah. Um, and it will not be a matter of, um, you know, a, an object that is very removed from us. Another thing I should say is, it's possible that a black hole affected life on Earth. Uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. How? Um, you know, that black hole right now is dormant. It's very faint. Mm -hmm. But we know that it flares. When a star like the sun comes close to it, mm -hmm. uh, the star will be spaghettified, basically become a, a stream of gas, like a spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And then the gas would fall into the black hole and there would be a flare. Mm -hmm. And this process happens once every 10,000 years or so. So we expect that you know these flares to occur every 10,000 years. But we also see evidence for the possibility that gas clouds were disrupted by the black hole because the, the stars that are close to the black hole are residing in a single or two planes. And the only way you can get that is if they formed out of a disk of gas, just like the planets in the solar system formed. So there is evidence that gas fell into the black hole and powered possibly a flare. And these flares produce X-rays and ultraviolet radiation that could damage life if if the Earth was close enough to the center of the galaxy. Where we are right now, it's not very risky for us, but there is a, a theoretical argument that says the solar system, the sun, was closer to the galactic center early on and then it migrated outwards. Oh, so maybe, maybe in the early stage of the solar system, the conditions you know, were affected, shaped by these flares of the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And that's why for the first two billion years, there wasn't any oxygen in the atmosphere, you know, who knows? But um, it's just interesting to think that, you know, from a theoretical concept that Einstein resisted in 1939, it may well be that, you know, uh, black holes have influence on our life. And that, you know, it's just like discovering that some uh, f uh, stranger, affected your family and in a way your life and um, you know if that happens to be the case a second nobel prize should be given not not for just the discovery of this black hole at the center of the galaxy but perhaps for the nobel prize in chemistry for the effect that it had for the on effect life. for the for the interplay that resulted in some kind of uh yeah so, so the, yeah the chemical effect Bi biology, I mean, all those kinds of things in, in terms of uh, the emergence of uh, life and the creation of a habitable environment. That's so fascinating. And of course, like you said, dark matter, like if black holes have some- something. They could be the dark matter in principle, yes. Uh, we don't know uh, what the dark matter is at the moment.